no pressure. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it is. Uh, it's always an honor and a, a privilege to uh, come here to open the Word of God and to um, be able to come back and uh, join uh, one of the great places that the Lord used in my own heart and life and uh, early on in my Christian experience and um, forever, forever thankful for what the Lord did when, when I was here. And I only see it going in a better direction. I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. But what I want to try to do this morning is share something that is uh, kind of dovetails with our ministry. And uh, I always preface what I say when I talk about this. Because I don't want the people to uh, come away with the wrong impression that, well, you know, you talk about Israel because you're, you're Jewish, or you talk about Israel because of your ministry, and that has nothing to do with that. I talk about Israel because God chose the Jewish people, and if you read the Bible, you're going to read about Israel. If he chose the Dutch people, we'd be talking about the Dutch people, right? <laughs> so we talk about Israel because he chose the Jewish people. But in 1 Chronicles 17, very interesting question is, is asked. 1 Chronicles 17. In verse 21, and it says, And what one nation in the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make you a name by great and terrible things, and driving out nations from before your people, whom you redeemed out of Egypt? So we know what the assumed answer. There is no other nation. And it's not because of Israel that this is true. It's because of God and what he has done and what he is doing and what he will do with them. Well, with that said, let's ask God to bless, bless our time together. Heavenly Father, we want to commit this time to you as we open your word. We are dependent upon the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and insight into these truths. Pray that the word will go forth in great power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit, and not in words which we could uh, bring up, and that we would be able to uh, see your heart in this wonderful matter of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What I want to try to do is establish the foundation. And the foundation is that God chose the Jewish people from all of the other families that were on the earth. And it's important for us to keep in mind, he could have chosen anybody he wanted to. There wasn't anything inherent within the people of Israel that forced him to choose them. But it does say in Deuteronomy 7, if you wouldn't mind turning there, because these are some foundational verses. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 9 where it says for you are a holy people to the Lord your God the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and, a re and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. So clearly this establishes the biblical fact that God chose Israel. It wasn't because they were the fewest people or the greatest number of people. It was a decision that God made. Sometimes people ask me, why did God choose the Jewish people? And the answer is given in verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God. He chose Israel because He's God. Another way of saying that, God is sovereign. It was a sovereign choice on the part of God. He didn't go out, send out some pollsters to say, hey, would you kind of get an idea of how people react if I choose Israel? <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think he could have cared less. He did it because he was God and he is a faithful God. He entered into covenant relationship with Abraham, carried on through Isaac, and carried on through Jacob. So foundational, very important. God chose the people of Israel because he wanted to. His choosing the people of Israel also brings great, great blessings to the Gentiles. Uh, all of you who are Jewish, can you raise your hand real high? This is the same response I get in most churches. Most churches are made up are not made up of a majority of, of Jewish people from a Jewish background. We're in the times of the Gentiles, but there is a remnant according to the election of grace where Jewish people will get saved. But great, great blessings have come to the Gentiles as a result of choosing the people of Israel. Because God chose the Jewish people, point number one, point number two is Israel has been and still are the most hated people group who's ever been on the planet. Israel is, even to this day, the most hated people group on the earth. Why is that? Why is that? People ask, why, why do people hate the Jewish people? Especially when you consider some of the contributions that they've made to the earth. Many people are still alive because of some of the vaccines that have come out through them and on. The list could go on and on and on. And maybe you have not heard this, but there's a, a worldwide attempt to boycott anything that Israel's ever done. There's a, there, there's a organized boycott. If Israel made it, boycott it. They want to see their economic situation just crash as a result of that. Why is it? Why is it that there's this intense hatred by, uh, by nations, by individuals, that goes towards the Jewish people? A lot of people don't even know why they hate them, they just hate them. Some people were raised in that atmosphere and it just kind of carried on with them. But I believe there's a biblical reason. There's, there's a biblical reason why this hatred is manifesting itself, and it goes back to Genesis. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden, where God created Adam and made Eve, and um, told them, gave, gave them a restriction. We all know what it is, don't eat from this tree. We know that they disobeyed. The warning came true. They died immediately spiritually, and then they ultimately died physically. But when they disobeyed, God had a word for each of those involved. He had a word to say to Adam. He had a word to say to Eve. And he had a word to say to the devil, Satan, who was manifest in the serpent. And it's very interesting what God said to the serpent. And I won't read verse 14, but 15 is part of what he said to the devil. I, and this is a this is a monumental verse. It's the first messianic prophecy given in the Bible. It's the first promise of a Messiah Redeemer. It's the first promise where somebody would, would come and reverse what just took place in the garden as a, as a result of their disobedience. And verse 15 says, I will put enmity, he's talking to the serpent, Satan in the form of the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, the seed, he will bruise you on the head. The word bruiser means crush. And you shall bruise him on the heel. Well, I'd rather be crushed on the bruised on the heel than crushed in the head. Crushed in the head is, is fatal. So Satan, all, all, all Satan knows is that through the seed of a woman, through another human being who's going to be born, something's going to do me some major damage. So now his goal, as Adam and Eve begin to be fruitful and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply, 
and, and the population is growing and growing, and every male that is born, Satan is saying, could this be the one? Could, so he wants to do whatever he can to corrupt the, the human race. Maybe that would prevent this Messiah Redeemer from coming into being. Well, if you just read a few chapters down, Satan did an incredible job. Because God looks down and what does he see? He only sees wickedness. Wickedness everywhere. So he destroys the entire planet of people except Noah and his family. As progressive revelation continues, you get to Genesis chapter 12, God gives further insight into this seed, this, this one uh, who, who's going to come and crush uh, Satan, his head, among other things, bring redemption into the world. <coughs> it's brought out that it's going to be through the lineage of Abraham, followed through Isaac and, and Jacob. So now Satan doesn't have to seek to go around uh, trying to destroy and pervert all of humanity. He can zero in now. He goes from a shotgun to a bullet, and he zeroes in on the descendants of Abraham. So that's really, really where his attacks uh, are aimed. He doesn't have to worry about all of the other people. That's not where this seed is going to come from that God told, told, told us about, the seed of the woman. So really, when you think about this, this hatred, this desire of Satan to destroy the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's a, it's a spiritual battle. It's really what it is. All of this anti-Semitism that we see, it's nothing more than Satan trying to do anyway, use anybody who, who would help him in this endeavor. Now, whether they know about it or not, this is really what Satan's desire is. So there, there's always been a Satan who, who wants to destroy the people of Israel. There, there's always been a Pharaoh. There's always been a Haman. There's always been a Hitler. There's always been, there are, there are people right now in the Middle East that would li like nothing more than to come into contact with some kind of atomic military bombs. And what's the first thing they would do? Well, they, they've told us what the first thing they would do with them. Blow Israel off the map. Can that happen? Can that happen? You know, God tells us how to destroy Israel. He does. He tells us how in Jeremiah 31. And it's not by blowing them off the map with an atomic bomb. He tells us in Jeremiah 31, the thing, what you have to do to destroy Israel from being a people is get rid of the sun, <laughs> get rid of the moon, get rid of the stars in the sky, and stop the waves of the ocean. Now, if you can do those things, then God says, then you can destroy this people from being a nation. So they're going about it all wrong. <laughs> but what do those verses actually say? Actually, those verses, as you well know, tell us that Israel is an indestructible nation. They're indestructible. Now, they may not know it. They, they, they may not know that. Um, but they are. Bible says they are. Now, that's not said about America. That's not said about Japan. It's not said about the Chinese people. It's not said about the former Soviet Union. It's not said about any people group except the people of Israel. They are an indestructible people. They will continue to be hated. You say, well, wait a minute. Hold on a second. That brings up a good point. The Messiah has already come. Satan has failed. He's been judged. But the hatred for the Jewish people hasn't stopped. Have you, have you noticed that? If you're Jewish, you wouldn't want to be living in France right now, and in parts of Argentina, and in other parts of the world, anti-Semitism anti is just going off the graph in some of those areas. Well, wait a minute. If, if the Messiah has already come, why is Satan still desirous to destroy Israel? Well, the only answer to that is, is they, they have a great future, which most of the, quote, church denies now. More people deny Israel's future than still hold to the fact that there's going to be a 
future. But I do believe that that is a great indicator and a great reason to hold to the fact that God does have a future for them. So principle number one, God shows the Jewish people from all, among all the nations of the earth, and because of that, Israel has been and still is the most hated people group on the planet. It's, it's, it's Satan inspired. It's, it's his desire to fight against what God has chosen. Point number three, three. God's choosing of Israel benefits those from a Gentile background who are believers. In fact, the only reason why you are believers is because of Israel's disobedience. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Now again, we're, 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 we're discussing biblical facts, biblical truths about Israel. You won't hear this on cable TV, on the news networks when they talk about Israel. They usually just simply make Israel look like the bad guy. And uh, so we, want to, we, we don't want to draw our theology from them. We want to get it from the scriptures. Look with me, at, and by the way, Romans 11 and following, Paul the Apostle is speaking specifically to the Gentiles as the Apostle to the Gentiles. And these verses really should be some of your favorite verses. Look what they clearly teach. I say then, they, Israel, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their, by Israel's transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Salvation, the door of salvation opened up to the Gentiles as a result of Israel's transgression. That's another way to look at it, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Many, many blessings have come to Gentile believers as a result of Israel's disobedience. Now, it's important as Paul goes down, later in this chapter, he points out a very important truth. There are some whole complete denominations, whole complete seminaries that teach that God is finished with the people of Israel. And they base it on things like this. Look, Israel had their chance, and they transgressed. They disobeyed God. So from their perspective, God has taken all of these covenant blessings that could have been Israel's and should have been Israel's, but they're not because of their disobedience, and has given them to the church. And they love that. Oh, yeah, they love that. Of course, Israel still retains the cursings, but they got the blessings. And they just think that that's fun and dandy, but I don't, I don't like that. It has nothing to do with my background, has nothing to do with my ministry, it has everything to do with the fact that I'm a member of the church, the body of Christ, like you are if you're a believer. And look at the church. If Israel, if Israel's blessings were removed because of their disobedience, what has the church been? Look at the direction the church is going. I mean, it's, it's, it's abysmal. The representations you see of, quote, the church on, on various t uh, cable channels, books that are being written, people that are literally traveling, traveling around the world, uh, to me making, making it foolish of what it means to be a, a believer. Totally misrepresenting what the church is. So if God took the blessings away from Israel because of this, their disobedience, why should we, we be so confident that he hasn't made some changes with us? <clears throat> he hasn't taken certain things away from us. This to me also is probably the greatest attack on the faithfulness of God. We just read it. We, we, we just said it. Great is thy faithfulness. How do we know God is faithful? Because he's main, maintaining uh, true to his promises to a people that don't deserve it. Israel. I'd rather see God remain faithful to them. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. But in, as a result of Israel's disobedience, salvation has been opened up to the Gentiles. He even goes on in this chapter 11 where he, he tells the uh, Gentile believers 
don't be arrogant. Don't, don't be arrogant in the fact that I took Israel and, and set them aside for a while. I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, verse 25, of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until. That means there's going to come an end, right? There's going to come an end to this partial hardening, to this partial to, to this blindness. It's going to come to an end, and then God is going to save the entire remnant in one fell swoop there. Verse 26, all Israel will be saved. Don't be, don't, don't be arrogant, Gentile believers, is what Paul is telling them. So point number one, God chose the Jewish people from among all the nations of the earth. Israel has been and still is the most hated people group on the planet. God's choosing of Israel benefited Israel. And still does benefit the Gentiles. And one of the ways, uh, some of the ways in which the Gentiles have benefited is that you have become sharers, sharers of the covenants that God made with the people of Israel. Jump over to chapter 15 for a second. This kind of is a continuation of, of that point in, in point three. But this is something I'm just going to tell you flat out. It's something that you will rarely hear in many churches, it, but Paul is very clear on it. Paul had a desire to go to Spain, verse 24, but verse 25 says, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going there to serve the saints, the poor saints in Jerusalem. For Macedonia and Achaia, those are Gentile churches, you read about this incident in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Now, verse 27 is a very, very important verse. Yes, they were pleased to do so. And they, these Gentile churches, these believers, these Gentile believers, they are indebted to them. Paul, what do you mean? How are Gentile believers indebted to these Jewish believers. If, if, if Paul didn't tell us, this is one of those topics where we'd have 27 different opinions. But we only have to have one opinion because he, he tells us why. For if the Gentiles have shared in their, the Jewish people's, spiritual things. Let's stop there for a second. Have the Gentiles shared in the spiritual things that God intended for Israel? Yes. You are sharers of the Abrahamic covenant. Do you know that nobody gets saved without going through Abraham? Abraham is not our Messiah. Abraham is not the, 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 the gospel plan of salvation. But the Abrahamic covenant promises the seed, right? It, it's the Abrahamic covenant that promised the seed and Paul tells us in Galatians, he says, not seeds, plural, but seed, singular, who is Christ. Christ sprang out of the 